Hi, everybody, and welcome to U.S. Farm Report. This week, a visit with three NFO leaders, the first of whom is Jim Ziegler. Jim lives at Chatfield, Minnesota, works for NFO in southern Wisconsin. How long have you been a member of NFO? Since 1963. It was in that year that my father joined the National Farmers Organization while I was in the service. Yeah. Well, uh, what kind of farming do you do in Minnesota, Jim? Well, basically, diversified agriculture of hog, dairy, beef, and uh, some specialty crop of uh -huh. beans and grain farming. How many cows were you milking? We were milking 61 cows that, one, that year that I left the farm to go to work for the National Farmers Organization. Did you have a pretty good uh, replacement program going? Or? Well, usually we tried to uh, establish a breeding program which would give us uh, shot at a 600-pound herd average mm -hmm. within a reasonable amount of time. Yeah. Where are you working now uh, for the field staff uh, department? My area is contained uh, 31 counties in the Madison marketing area of southern Wisconsin and northern Illinois. Well, now, that's the real heart of Wisconsin's dairy land, isn't it? Well, the, the people in northern Wisconsin would give you an <laughs> argument about that, but uh, there's a great deal of production in southern Wisconsin. There's well, you know the town of Stoughton, then. Yes, sir. Stoughton, Wisconsin. We uh, came, U.S. Farm Report, came to Stoughton, Wisconsin on the occasion of that uh, collection point being opened, and we did uh, one of our U.S. Farm Report shows there, and I presume that uh, that collection point has been very successful. Well, to be truthful, that was our grand opening uh, of NFO's maiden voyage as a federal milk marketing agency. Is that right? Right. Uh, this was the thing that got us the opening to become the first general farm organization to have independent marketing rights for their production of their members' products. And uh, uh, a milestone in NFO's progress. I don't think anything uh, in our dairy program to date has been able to match it mm -hmm. or had been equal to it up to that time. Well, now, <clears throat> at the very heart of NFO's dairy marketing structure is the collection point, isn't it, Jim? Right, Bill. This gives us the opportunity to bring the farmer's production together, move it out in transport load lots to wherever we find the best market for it. This no longer has to be put through a buyer or mm -hmm. processor and then distributed. Mm -hmm. The National Farmers Organization now has that right to do that for the member. Well, can you outline for us exactly what happens uh, to the farmer's milk production prior to, to it being shipped out of the collection point uh, in detail? For example, uh, a small tank truck comes by and picks it up. Isn't that the start of it? Right, Bill. The, the farmer's milk is picked up in exactly the same procedure that it always had been with the trucker doing the washing of the tank and picking it up on a daily or bi-daily basis. Mm -hmm. He then hauls it to the collection point at Stoughton or Hartford or Menasha or one of the others and unloads it, pumping it over either into a holding tank or into another transport of a large capacity. At Stoughton, capacity. for example, when we were there, Jim, it was pumped directly from the smaller truck that called on the farmers into the over-the-road truck. Right. Directly to this the This is truck. the over-the-road semi-transport. Yeah. That will haul anywhere from 40 to 50,000 pounds. It's a marvelous story, and of course, uh, the interesting thing to me is the fact that uh, there is very little temperature rise in that milk from the time it leaves the farmer's tank until the time that the, uh, the big over-the-road tanker delivers the milk. Uh, it's, it's, it's kept so cool and so well insulated. They tell me that you could set one of those trucks out in the open sun for a day, and the temperature rise inside might be one degree, two at the outside. Right, Bill. In fact, we can take our Wisconsin milk, which we are doing, incidentally, and moving it to the, into the state of Georgia. And we won't witness a three degree, degree temperature increase in the entire mm -hmm. distance from southern Wisconsin down into the state of Georgia. Mm -hmm. So this milk is in exactly as good a state as started out from the farm. Did we mention, Jim, that when the farmer's milk is brought into the collection point that the first thing that's done is an inspection, a sample is taken, right? I don't believe we had mentioned it, Bill, but this is very carefully taken care of because we want National Farmers Organization milk to be the finest milk on the market. And we determined to see that the product remains of the highest quality. Mm -hmm. Because in order to maintain a fine market 
and a clientele which enjoys our product, we have to be assured that we have the finest. And we intend to keep this strict procedure. Well, in a few words, Jim, what does it look like for the future? What's the status quo marketing-wise, and what's in the future? Things are looking good, aren't they? Well, the market is virtually unlimited. As our population increases, it's the younger people that drink the milk. And with having uh, obtained marketing rights, we might very well say that for the dairyman, the sky is the limit. As far as the dairy farmers are willing to push the program, they have every right to do this now. And they have the organization, which is made up entirely of producers, to handle this for them. It's a situation which has never before been obtainable by the American farmer, really. For the first time, we have one organization which is governed by the farmer, controlled by the farmer, and managed by the farmer to handle his product. It's no longer that we have to take what the market would like to give us, or in plain language, going out to beg for it. Mm -hmm. We now have a pricing formula, which we can establish. What can you tell me about new membership in the area in which you work? Are more dairy farmers coming to NFO? Are they joining NFO? Bill, uh, the membership pickup has been something to behold in the last few months. In any area where the membership, or what I would say the old membership, wish to get new membership, it's relatively easy to do it. Because we've got a program which is completely positive, which is much less expensive to the farmer in the way of marketing costs than the old marketing system, and which for the first time gives the new member the immediate opportunity to move into the sale of his product. As you may remember, when the National Farmers Organization first started, we first had to establish a membership and organize and then find a processor and then establish a contract and sell this product. All of these steps have already been taken care of. Now, when a new member joins the National Farmers Organization, the program is set up and operating. and He can move into it to get the benefits immediately of price, of protection, of the best market in the nation, and the best opportunity to have an organization with his own control being in the driver's seat. Next, we visit with Bob Hutchison. Bob Hutchison is a cotton farmer from Tulare County, California. He is a director in NFO's cotton program in that part of the United States. I'm a cotton farmer myself. Are you? Uh, uh, how many acres of land do you have there? Uh, 240 acres in a farm. Yeah. Well, now, California is really the number one cotton-producing state in the country, isn't it now? You mean more, more most bales? Uh, no, I wouldn't say so. Probably, I really don't know, factually. I know the real. Probably a million. 100,000 this year. Well, at any rate, it's, a, it's, it's among the top states. Oh, yes. Yeah. Of course, a, a tenth of the cotton in the nation is going to California. Yeah. Most people have the feeling, you know, that cotton is a crop that has to be grown in the South, and uh, right. that's really not true at all. We saw a lot of cotton growing in Amarillo and around that uh, part right. of the country. Texas. This was well, no doubt Thailand cotton. Texas grows the most bales. Yeah. Many, many more acres. Well, now, <coughs> uh, as a director in NFO's cotton program, you're working sort of away from home, aren't you, Bob? Uh, not really. Uh, I'm working in California and in Arizona, and uh, I travel and work with other people in the, in the organization who yeah. carry on. But you are working, work. too, then, in Tulare County, in your home county. I work in my, home, in my home county and the uh, entire San Joaquin I Valley, see. Imperial, in Riverside County, and uh, in Arizona. Bob, a year ago in October, when we visited with the Waddy brothers, there was no cotton program for NFO. Now there is, and you're very much a part of it. Tell us about the program. Yes, we've, we've been uh, very happy with the results in the short time that the National Farmers Organization has been involved in cotton. We set out in, uh, in just a short time uh, due to a real need for a cotton price in order for the cotton farmer to exist mm -hmm. in the nation. We've set out to put the National Farmers Organization in the cotton business. And we've been very successful. We've sold cotton in every cotton-producing section of the nation, nationwide. And this is the only way that the organization will work and can work, and it is working, 
and creating an upward pressure on the prices of cotton today. Bob, let me ask you this. How do you go about getting this kind of a program established? I think perhaps the first ingredient is uh, to have a desire to receive at least a cost of production plus a reasonable markup. And this is a desire of every farmer in the nation today. And it's, he is not receiving it in the cotton program, yes. I mean, in the cotton field. Uh, for instance, in most cases, it's a, approximately 30 cents is a cost of production on cotton across the nation today per pound. And the net return after figuring all the costs uh, is about, well, let's put it another way. It costs about 30 cents or $150 to produce a bale of cotton. And the net return is about $100 plus the government payment. And the government payment, as you know, limits the production of cotton and also as in the past been used to establish prices. Mm -hmm. uh, a buyer would uh, always quote uh, 100 points over loan or 150 points over loan or 20 points over loan or whatever. It's always so much over loan. And now looking at the new farm program, uh, in, in the end result with a net weight of the bale being involved in and not the gross weight, that's 21 pounds, doesn't seem too significant, but it'll be as much as $10 a bale less in the loan. And we're already going broke at farming cotton. Mm -hmm. And with this and with the, with the habits in the past of the buyers, always connecting it to loan, loan establishing price. Well, while it's sometimes called a floor, it's also a ceiling. And the fact that uh, out of a bale of cotton, there's something like 515 shirts can be made. These shirts are sold in the United States for an average of about $7.50 a piece or over $3,000. The farmer's net return on the farm for a bale of cotton is $114. Quite a in spread. Most cases, quite a spread. It's quite a spread. In, in thread, it's even more, mm -hmm. something like $6,000 on a bale mm -hmm. of cotton. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is neither here, here nor there. This is the business of the mills of the processors, in every case, they all work on a cost of production plus a reasonable markup. Well, then, and that's just good business. Yes. But we haven't been doing this. So what we're trying to do now is put ourselves on a cost of production plus a markup basis. Now, in setting out to do your job with the buyer, I presume that this pricing habit of his had to be changed somewhat. Well, the ultimate goal of the NFO is contracts a year ahead on every commodity. A contract will establish a price and also establishes production. Uh, we've had uh, occasions in the past with other commodities to have contracts. Uh, the contracts are a result of a processor knowing how many tomatoes he can process, mm -hmm. uh, how many he can sell. He knows uh, how much of uh, sugar, sugar beet contracts, uh, many different ones. They, they have established, for instance, in California, sugar beets. A farmer in California will not grow sugar beets without a contract. Why? Because there's no market for it. But the end result is it does set the price on the commodity at a price that he knows before he plants the crop exactly what he's going to receive for it, if he can produce the, the, the crop. Then all he has to worry about is producing it. But he knows and makes up his mind that this is the price he's going to receive. So he has a choice there. The farmer who is not on a contract, he has no market at all, with it, unless he wants to feed it to cattle or something like this, and it's quite a lot more expensive than that to produce. So the end result is that the processor knows that he has a supply coming to his processing plant. He knows exactly what it costs, what it's going to cost a year ahead. This puts him in a better position to put a price on his commodity. And I think the end result will be ultimately good for the nation, economically the only answer really. The processor or the cotton buyer, he doesn't mind paying the cotton producer a fair price for his cotton just so long as he is assured a supply, a dependable supply, and uh, so long as he is assured that his competitor is not buying at a lower price. Isn't that about it? That's absolutely right. The only thing a buyer that's buying any commodity or anything for that matter thinks of is 
what can his competitive buyer buy that commodity for? Mm -hmm. If no other buyer can buy it cheaper than he can, then he has no problem. Then he, he only has to compete in marketing of his commodity, establishing the fact and putting his own cost into the, the process and the next mm -hmm. step up the ladder of retailing it. Well, now, the buyer then already in the short-lived cotton program of NFO is pretty well convinced that the NFO cotton producer uh, is going to be able to guarantee him a, a supply of cotton, right? This is one thing we have done. We've uh, we sold cotton on uh, future contracts. Uh, on those contracts, all of the contracts, the farmers delivered the cotton, and this is the only way to do business. Uh, by the, the yes, to answer your question, absolutely yes. It's, a, it's on a contract, and there, it, it's a binding contract, and that supplier knows that he has a supply. And this is the only problem he has, is knowing that he has the production and knowing what it's going to cost him. And the old, old method uh, in cotton and all other commodities, the processor never knew exactly where the, where the commodity was going to come from, never knew exactly how much of it he was going to be able to obtain. He never knew what the price was going to be. And in many cases, uh, just a year or so ago, cotton went to 40 cents. Uh, we got a black eye. The farmer did, but we didn't do that. It was just a matter of uh, somebody got scared and thought they were going to run a little short, and they went out and started buying cotton. And this was not healthy for the cotton industry. But right back to the same thing, straight line, one thing in mind, cost of production plus a markup, like every other industry, everybody in the United States who is in business does business this way. And that's the way the farmer is going to have to do it. And that was our visit with Bob Hutchison. Our next interview was with Paul Fulkerson, whose home state is Kentucky. Paul works for the field staff department of NFO, and I asked Paul to describe his job. Well, my job is to recruit, train, supervise uh, workers, uh, more or less a general flock, anything there is to be done, why, that's what the, I'm supposed to do. Well, the field staff department is the department that's really out there on the firing line. Right, the field staff department, they have to hit all the first, they break into new territories, they organize, then they come along with their communications and coordinate their previous efforts. Right, well how's it going? Are, are good people easy to come by these days or is it pretty tough? Well, no, it, it's pretty easy, uh, Bill. Uh, the only thing is that uh, the farmers are so doggone near broke, they don't know which way to go. And uh, the best people in the world are farmers. I've yeah. always said that. And uh, it's just a matter of convincing them that uh, they need to help themselves instead of depending on somebody else. Right. What about you, Paul? Where's your home? Uh, right here in Louisville. Here in Louisville, right. Kentucky. Right. This is right. the old right. hometown. Right here in Louisville. Yeah, well, that's great. Uh, you're, you're a farmer. I mean, you. this is, of course, your background, but are you actively farming now, or do you have time to well, do it? Well, no, I've... Uh, I have some cattle. I have two farms. I have one in Kentucky and one in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. But uh, I just uh, raise uh, feeder calves, cow and calf plants. Yeah. And I'll probably see them once every six weeks, something like that. Well, we don't have to talk about some of the strides that NFO has made in this feeder cattle program. This has been one of the dandies, hasn't it? Sure has, Bill. I just uh, was checking over my records uh, this uh, fall after I sold my feeder calves four years ago. Off the same cows, well, uh, I probably had two or three extra, but uh, the same number of calves uh, with the same male. Uh, my calves averaged 20 cents four years ago, and this year they averaged 35. So I feel like it's uh, it's real progress when you can get $15 a hundred on a, a feeder calf in four years and keep putting pressure on the market. Yeah, that's just outstanding. Okay. Just outstanding. Well, what about uh, the area in which you're working now? You, you're working in uh, Georgia. Right. And Tenna in Mississippi? Yes, sir. And where else? There is uh, Alabama and Florida. I have four states. Four states. Right. Boy, you do have a lot of territory to cover. Well, it's quite a bit. And, uh, of course, we do the best we can, uh, even though uh, we can't get around to all of them at mm -hmm. once. But uh, it's a moving on real good. I've been working uh, mostly within the last six months in the broiler belt. Well, let's talk about this broiler situation now. W.O. Thomas. 
uh, from Coleman, Alabama, as you know, has been talking with mm -hmm. us about the situation there. Uh, the space holding action that's been going on there since April. Uh, what about uh, the broiler situation in Georgia, which is, of course, one of the top broiler producing states in the country? Well, uh, Bill, it, it looks real good to me. I know, uh, of course, again, uh, I say uh, it's just me down there organizing, but uh, I'm beginning to pick up some help. And uh, as far as the people, the acceptance of NFO, it's real good. Uh, they're beginning to realize that uh, they're not going to get anywhere uh, producing chickens at a loss. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of uh, hard sometimes for people to see that, uh, especially broiler producers, that they are losing money. But uh, it's it, uh, coming to light, and uh, even some of the uh, professional people are beginning to wake up. I had a banker to call me uh, uh, this uh, past Sunday night, and he's wanting to... Uh, go to work with us in NFO. Mm -hmm. uh, he said it's more important than uh, anything else because whenever the farmer leaves, he won't have no bank. This is true. He realized it. Uh, I also had a professor uh, from a uh, college in uh, Georgia to call me, and uh, he wants uh, an interview with me. He's interested. Mm -hmm. So when you get uh, tracking these kind of people, well, you know that there's uh, interest out there and that we have uh, showed the people really what NFO is. Well, I think that one of the great potential strengths for NFO is to get support from people outside of uh, farming specifically, don't you? And oh, this is uh, a good indication sure. of that kind of strength. That's right. We, uh, we've got to have, we always uh, have had uh, a lot of it, and we're going to continue to have some. But uh, right now, I think that when these people start uh, to realize really what the uh, NFO organization is, and then is when the farmers are really going to uh, start looking more towards NFO because a lot of them have been uh, pulled away for different reasons and uh, it's new and it just takes a while to, uh, sure. to get accepted to it. What kind of prices are these uh, Georgia broiler producers getting right now, Paul? Well, uh, Bill, the prices aren't too good. Uh, of course, the pressure from Alabama has uh, helped uh, up. They haven't mm -hmm. uh, cut their price any. Uh, and I say the pressure from Alabama, there's been an awful lot of pressure over in Georgia. They've uh, brought chickens over there. They've uh, put extra chickens in to take care of them. Uh, the uh, sanitation program, they don't have to clean their houses now out after each uh, grow out. Uh, now this is quite a step forward for the producer, isn't it? Now, as you say, he used to have to clean the house out with every batch, didn't he? Right and uh, now it isn't necessary. He can still maintain right. good sanitation without that big expense. How does he maintain the sanitation, Paul? Well, uh, they, they come in and uh, they spray the house now free of charge. They don't charge a producer for this. Mm -hmm. uh, before, they charged them for the litter, and the uh, fact of it is they even did the hauling, and now then they've let the, it out the hauling to the, a group of growers, mm -hmm. and they do the hauling. They don't control that anymore. Well, is the price up to around two cents in Georgia, or is it under that? Well, it, it's about two cents. Of course, you can come down uh, on some of the contracts they have to uh, one sixty-five. I see. And up to two sixty-five. Yeah. Of course, some of them says that their uh, two cents is the least they can make, but really, uh, as long as you have this feed conversion thing going mm -hmm. like it is, uh, it can be anything. Mm -hmm. What's the outlook? What do you think is going to happen in Georgia in broilers? Well, you asked me a question, and I'm going to answer. We're going to organize the broiler producers. They're going to get a price uh, for their work. Well, they almost have to, don't they? Sure. They, they either have to do this, or they're out of business. That's it's right. Perhaps that simple. That's right. Uh, you can't produce uh, anything at a loss and stay in business very long. Yeah. I don't care what you're doing. And the broiler producers are actually losing money. Uh, in other words, they, they call themselves chicken house janitors, which yeah. is kind of a a low way of putting it, but really that's what it is. And uh, the integrators are beginning to wake up. Uh, we've had a few of them talking one thing or another. I had one of them to tell a couple of members uh, last week that if the NFO uh, got in control of the broiler industry, it would be the best thing that ever happened to him. So this is an indication that uh, they're waking up also. Well, you know, to get one of the integrators to talk is uh, <laughs> to talk to, to the producer something, isn't it? That's right. They, they never did before. <laughs> <laughs> what about uh, the outlook for NFO in your four-state region, just generally, in terms of membership and uh, attitude, Paul? Well, uh, Bill, it, it looks real good. In fact, I've been uh, just uh, 
in my thinking, it looks better than it ever has because, uh, in general, as I said a while ago, when these professional people uh, start uh, talking and calling in and get interested, uh, it's going to have an effect on the farmers themselves. And, of course, they get literature from uh, these different colleges, and some of the bank puts out literature and one thing or another. And uh, it, it just looks real good to me because they see now that there's no other hope. Uh, all over uh, my area, uh, progressive farmers are joining NFO. Paul, although we've talked mainly here about broilers in Georgia, you're vitally interested in all commodities in uh, the four-state area in which you work, aren't you? Sure. Uh, we've uh, made great gains in uh, uh, the marketing of hogs, uh, soybeans, feeder cattle, and uh, well, just about anything that they produce. And uh, in the broiler area, they have some real good feeder cattle, and uh, that's coming on real good. We're expecting a, <coughs> a sale. Uh, probably uh, about the 1st or the middle of January out of the uh, brawler area. And uh, I don't bypass anyone just because that he's not a brawler producer. This is really not a, a brawler organization. Uh, it, uh, NFO uh, bargains for any commodity that's produced on a farm, and we don't shun anyone. We need them all. We want them all. And I feel like just in the not-too-distant future that uh, we're going to get the biggest part of it. Paul Fulkerson? Bob Hutchison, Jim Ziegler, typical members of the National Farmers Organization, typical NFO leaders, young men with a purpose, young men who are working arduously to save the family farms of America. Progressive farmers join NFO. U.S. Farm Report is seen each week at this same time on this same station. Until we meet again, so long, everybody.